Welcome to the Culture Track. Let's get it going. I think everyone's rolling in. I've uh, got two silver pitch pitches to do. Silver sponsors are uh, Alien Vault. I work there. Uh, that's going to be easy. Simple way for organizations to detect and respond to today's ever-evolving threat landscape. Our unique and award-winning approach, trusted by thousands of customers, combines essential security controls of our all-in-one platform, Alien Vault Unified Security Management, with the power of Alien Vault's Open Threat Exchange, the world's largest crowdsourced threat intelligence community, making effective and affordable threat detection attainable to resource-constrained IT teams. Uh, second silver sponsor, App Internals, our riverbed. Fix what matters. Riverbed App Internals is a big data APM solution that will help you detect and diagnose the gnarliest of performance problems. Get a free trial at appinternals.com. Thank you, silver sponsors. Even big, bigger shout out, we have Michael Cote. Uh, for you DevOps alum, you've probably seen this man on my left. Mr. Cote has been instrumental in founding the DevOps days from the get-go before there was a word DevOps days or DevOps. I met uh, Michael first at a uh, ops camp where we were trying to figure out uh, this problem and we ended up getting a name for it, which was DevOps. I used to read uh, about uh, Michael's stuff on the, my favorite blog, the Drunken Retired blog. That was awesome. Uh, currently, he is at Pivotal and a frequent contributor to DevOps Days. Welcome, Michael. Well, hello, everybody. How's it going? Uh, thanks for coming to this talk. I, I, I might need someone to make sure I don't, don't uh, die of thirst when I walk the way back there, so I need a buddy. Uh, anyways, uh, th this, is, this is a talk to, that called uh, DevOps for Normals. It's basically the, the kind of thing that I like to give as DevOps talks are um, when I go out and talk with people who are trying to implement this who are uh, normal, like uh, what their questions are and why they're doing it and how it's going for them. And uh, at, the, at the end, I'll, I'll wrap up with, now that I'm at Pivotal, I go talk with large organizations a lot, um, whether they're for-profit or, I don't think anyone's necessarily anti-profit, but uh, non-profit. Um, and they, they seem to have a particular uh, set of uh, characteristics or problems or shit shows they got to figure out. Um, and so I'll go over kind of like what, what I've picked up that's useful for them as well. And uh, if, if you're interested in the slides, uh, you can go get them by going to cote.io slash DevOps for normals. Uh, and I also put it in the Twitter stream because I'm very self-promotional and everything. Um, but there they are. So first of all, this is me up here. Uh, as, as Lee was going over, I, I've been um, in, I guess you would call it the infrastructure software area if you really wanted to bore people with a way of describing it. Um, as an analyst for about eight years across two, two companies, a little company called Red Monk where I worked for several years. And then I worked at 451 Research heading up the infrastructure software team that covered all sorts of stuff like this between the operating system and the application, if you will, everything that's in there. Uh, I worked in, at Dell for several years doing corporate strategy and M&A for software and for cloud, which, which gave me an interesting viewpoint on all of this. And I used to do uh, develop software a long time ago. And now I work at Pivotal, just going out and trying to explain why you would care about us and what we do and how you can uh, you know, get a bucket of water and get your hair to stop being on fire, if that's the position you're in, if, if it can be extinguished with software. Um, so if, if, if you end up uh, not detesting uh, stuff I'm doing, I have a lot of podcasts that I do and, uh, and blogging, and I write a column for the register and things like that as well. And then also, uh, this is the podcast that I do the most, uh, Software Defined Talk. It's more or less weekly. We don't really get paid for it, so when we don't want to do it, we don't. Um, it's, it sort of proves out economics, I guess. Um, but, you know, we were trying to get someone to sponsor the Jumbotron for us to just throw away $20,000 and let us broadcast from it. But it didn't happen. So now here we are. We've, uh, we've hacked our way into it. Success. <laughs> so uh, I, this is more, I, 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 li I like to start with conclusions more or less. That way you can leave uh, if you or I get bored. Um, and you can kind of get a sense of what I was going to talk about. And also, like, check this out. Like, you're not supposed to put a lot of words on slides, so I score. Um, <laughs> So first of all, there's three sections I want to go over. The first one is, because I'm an analyst, I have to overly contextualize things and talk about why you're doing it and the motivation. It makes me feel pretty good. 
And I want to give you a quick overview, hopefully uh, for you mercifully quick, uh, judging on like, you know, the way you guys dress, you probably don't care about business. But essentially, uh, why businesses are like stressed out and what they're looking for IT to do, and, and if IT is really up to the task of helping them out. As you, if you're reading ahead, you can see that IT is like in a pretty bad situation at the moment as far as helping businesses out. And then this is kind of like a follow-on of a little bit of what Ernest was talking about yesterday. Like I, th I think at these events, it's always good to have an attempt at least pointing to what DevOps is and how, how DevOps is going in the market. Because that certainly, this doesn't happen so much in Austin, but in lots of other geographies, one of the main things people ask is like, so what is DevOps? How do I do it? Right? Like I, I got these, C these DVDs and I haven't been able to install it yet. So it's good to kind of have an, a notion of like what it is that you can start going off of that's, that's useful. And then finally, as, as I said at the beginning, I'm going to go over um, kind of like my top things that don't seem totally asinine about advice that I would give to large organizations who not only want to do DevOps, but really want to start thinking about how they use custom written software to change how their business is, is operating and, and how it's doing better. Which, if you remember all that software is eating the word nonsense that all those charming people off on the West Coast have been propagating for a while. Like, that, that is a pretty real notion when you go out and talk with large organizations that most large organizations, as the people in this room would know it, don't really know what software is or how to use it or how to do it. And so the people that I go and visit, they want to know. And they're very curious to figure out how to do software and how to think about it as, as a thing that does their business. And so there's this great opportunity we have where they're, uh, there's a bunch of new people rediscovering stuff we know, which makes us study it and, and, and learn the, the tips about it more. It's a very polite way of saying they don't really know how to do software. So. Let, let's get into the first part, the business. Now, if, 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 you, uh, if you did your homework, I expect everyone looked up every talk I've ever done that's available on the internet before coming to this. You'll see that last year, like I had this notion of a donkey apocalypse, right? So there's like unicorns and horses, and my whole thing was like, well, most everyone's a donkey, right? Like they're hardworking and they're underappreciated, and they just want to like strap a carrot on their head and act like a unicorn. That's what they're trying to achieve. So. I, I still think we're in this, this thing, as, as we'll go through, where the needs of, of the business are, is not really, IT as we know it in aggregate is not really capable of meeting what the business wants them to do nowadays with custom written software and things like that. And then, uh, you know, I read that presentation, Secrets of Steve Jobs, and you're supposed to put an enemy up and then a hero comes in. Maybe that's Campbell, I get it mixed up. But like, we'll have a hero come in after this, this idiot, or uh, not an idiot, enemy. You know, I guess it seems like an idiot. Anyways, uh, here's some more words on slides. And, and you know, you don't need to read through this, but there's, what, what, what I want to go over here is that in the, in the sort of like outside of the IT department, in the business world, there's this sort of like, there's always a crisis in the business world, but there's this very um, kind of internal crisis, like a, a way that businesses have been operating and functioning and staying alive for a while is very much so at threat. And that is, if, 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 you, uh, if you ever have, have you know, read up a little bit on strategy, you'll come across this idea of competitive advantage. And it's basically, how does a business have sustainable long-term profits? And they gain a competitive advantage. Some reason or something that's unique to them that causes their customers, one, to come to them instead of competitors, and two, pay them a premium price, right? Like, that's how they get profit. And so, you know, you might see, like, uh, you know, large airplane manufacturers. It's just like... Their advantage is the ability to build airplanes, and it's really hard to get into that industry. So they have you know, a moat, as people would say, or uh, you know, large brand names of toothpaste, right? Like it's probably pretty hard to break into the toothpaste business because the competitive advantage toothpaste people have is like you know their brands and you trust them, and you're a little like some weird box at the bottom of the shelf. You're not sure if you want to stick that in your mouth or not, whereas like other ones you're happy with. So these kind of advantages, are, have been eroding a lot, and it's harder to keep a hold of these. And there's, almost, there's this era, as Professor McGrath has written about, and there's an HBR article, which is usually always better than the business book. In this case, the book's better uh, than just the article. But she introduces this idea of transient advantage, which for people in IT is sort of like, well, that's how the world operates. But it's basically that like your shelf life for anything that's unique and useful is very limited. And you need to instead think about renewing it as much as possible. So in the tech world, again, like this is how we live and breathe, right? We assume that once, once we write and compile some code that it's like bad, if I remember how developers mostly think about their own code. But like, it's, it's like we have to continually be innovating. But in the real world, so to speak, people don't really think about that, right? And you know, you, you can, this is where you bring in the usual cavalcade of funny like uh, Silicon Valley-minded companies like Uber and Airbnb and things like that, where who went into these more abundant industries and through using software and new ways of thinking about things are really disrupting other, other businesses. But 
when I go out and visit with people, you know, and you see this factoid that like it's hard to stay on the Fortune 500, like half of the companies since 2000 have uh, dropped off, or 52% if you like precision. Uh, and like this is what I encounter when I talk with executives and other people is they're, you know, they're very calm about it and they've got those shiny white teeth, but they're like freaked out about like figuring out how to how to out innovate their competitors and people who don't even exist yet. So then, since we're in IT, you know, we should be like, hey, IT to the rescue, we're going to help out. But like, if if you read through this chart, right? So o over here, like on on the uh, the left side, you've got a good summary of this. Like, and I think this is a pretty good prediction from Gartner that. If you're thinking about how am I going to use IT and custom written software to compete, well, you're not just going to go like buy a copy of accounting software or website software because your competitors will have that and that won't be different, right? So you need to write unique software that's unique to your business and helps you differentiate, right? So there's predictions that people will be doing this more, logically so. I'm sure there was a great pivot table that led to that 75 number there. But then you look at surveys, and this is just uh, one, one of many where, from the Cutter Consortium. And it's, it's kind of a low end, but I think, I think Cutter's trustworthy enough that it's legit. And it's basically asking, so for businesses, is IT, what's the role of IT in innovation? Is IT helpful, right? Like, sure, they get your desktops patched and you got Windows 10 running and everything, but like, is it helpful for innovation and doing new things? And you can see over the past three years or so, it's dropped down to basically uh, two thirds of, of IT is not really helpful for innovation, right? So, you know, this is awful. We're, we're not doing a good job helping businesses out. And again, this is what I tend to encounter and, and why Pivotal does pretty well selling things and lots of other vendors here, is the stacks and the processes and technologies that IT has in place is not really helping the business, as they say in, in the business world, move the needle. Like come up with new things and innovate and, and do things like that. It's really just helping. There's, there's you know, a lot of protection and things like that. But, Really, when it comes to putting out new software on a weekly or daily basis, the, the existing stacks are, are not very helpful for that. Um, and, I, and also, we'll get into a lot of the process and the way people think about using IT doesn't help out. Hence, we have this scenario, like when you go talk with people, sort of like this nightmarish apocalypse situation involving escalators, um, which isn't an allusion to any company or anything like that. But uh, like, like, you know, it really is like you go and talk with people, and, and like I said, they're, they're in a pretty dire situation, and they're, they're worried about their business because their IT is so awful. And then you get rogue IT and all this stuff where people are like desperately flailing about for stuff. And you, know, you guys probably all know that if you don't have some modicum of centralized control over your IT stuff after five years, you don't want to find a new job because you've got lots of technical debt and stuff doesn't work, and you know, you got, you got the uh, inmates running the asylum. So this, just very briefly, is sort of like this way that I think about uh, all of this. And, and, and to sum up, like, the kind of model I go about uh, traipsing about, like, where IT is useful. And I've kind of gone over the first few things, right? Businesses want to use IT more to put out custom software and services and customize how their business works. But IT is just kind of blows. It's not very helpful at doing that. And then so what we need to do is, is kind of revisit how we're thinking about doing software and, and, and how new technologies that we bring from successful companies, basically ones that rely on cloud stuff, if you will. And, and you'll see marketing people like me throw about this phrase cloud native. It just means using all that cloud stuff to do things. Uh, and, and it seems like these are things that have been proven to be successful at other companies, so how can we suck them into our organization to, uh, to not be on that nightmarish escalator? And I'm only going to talk about one of these tools here, but there, there's a, a guy I talk with in Twitter, and, and he's kind of in the pivotal world of stuff over at Travelers. And he has this good kind of stool, right? So you're trying to achieve like business agility on top, right? This is so solving the shiny white people teeth problems. And, and you've got technology, like you know, you've got your cloud technology down here, your sort of microservices, and your way about thinking doing software development. You're changing how you do that so you can deliver weekly and daily. And then over here, we'll be talking about a little bit of the processes, you know, having an agile mindset, having a DevOps approach to things, and definitely having a continuous delivery mindset of doing stuff. And for many of the people in the room, this stuff is sort of like, hey, welcome to 2005, right? Like, that's what we've been doing forever. But again, you've got to think, that's why this is called for normals, right? When you go out to regular companies, they're not really up to speed on this stool here, right? They're usually like barely balancing on one of those one-legged stools to, to get along. So, like I said, I'm not going to go over all of those things, but uh, I wanted to talk about how DevOps fits into all of this, right? And, and into supporting that stool, helping businesses better figure out how to use IT to stay alive and be competitive. And, and you know, I, I frequently go out and talk with people about what DevOps is and how it can fit with them. And uh, as, as Lee was saying, like, we've been pretty terrible uh, as a group about defining it. Like, I think we're just emerging out of this period where it was like taboo to even try to write it all down. 
right? Like there was this long time where it was like very difficult to characterize what it was and you weren't supposed to do that and so forth and so on. But I think we've come to a good place. And this is, this, is, uh, this guy Jay used to work on, on the team I was at on 451 and this is just a delightful piece of clip art here, right? Like you can see in 2010, he wrote this report trying to characterize everything that's in it. And it kind of, nothing against Jay at the time, this is good for 2010, but it kind of illustrates the problem is if you read through that, you're like, oh look, computers. Right? Like, this is how all a business is using computers and everything involved in it, which shows you the scope of DevOps, so it doesn't really classify it much. So at this point, it's, it's definitely important to start characterizing DevOps, because I see a lot of things like this uh, survey, from surveys. Uh, you know, this one pulled from Gartner. Just as a side note, now that I don't work at an analyst shop, I can acknowledge the existence of other analysts. It's great. They actually do good work that, that you can just, like, get stuff from. Uh, if you go look at them. It's, it's a funny thing that industry analysts like just do not build on their peers' work at all. They're just totally ignorant of it. Um, anyways, that's a fun field to talk about. But you see surveys like this emerging more and more, and if you add those numbers up, right, like, like we're, we're nearing like around 40%, right, 35 or 40% or so of people who are like piloting or doing DevOps. So, you know, your first question is like, well, what are you doing? Like, that's a huge amount of people, so what does this mean? But we see this a lot, so it's, it's good to go out and study and see what's actually happening. And this is another good phase in, in the life of DevOps where as the mainstream starts to do it, they also kind of start to redefine or refine what the definition is, right? And so we have to start contending with that and seeing if we like it or not. Like if you remember the old Agile days, if you get some like XP people and Scrum people uh, in a room with each other, they're kind of like the analysts I was talking about. They just like won't admit that each of the others actually does Agile and they'll like poop all over each other. And you know, that's not helpful for anyone. It just makes a big mess. So as, as more proof, like, like I said, I have a column at the register and every time I write a column in there, I mean, it's the register, so what do I expect? But like, I basically get two types of comments. No one's ever like, great job, Cote, which that's all I'm looking for. Uh, but you either get, you either get this, this comment over here, which is basically like, what the hell is DevOps? And, and then at length, it's like, I keep reading these articles and like, well, no one ever talks about what it is. And it's because it's kind of boring to write about. Uh, but, you know, like, so there really is this huge need for people to know what DevOps is. And there's this other delightful thing. Like, I mean, I have a, a pretty peculiar, uh, in all definitions of the word style, and this guy is doing a really good job at imitating me to insult me. So I, I actually like this. This is good stuff. He even mentions AS400s, which, you know, that's, that's wonderful. But, I get, I get this all the time, right? That if, if you go out and you talk about DevOps, people want to know what it is. So we started off a while ago, and I, I remember when I was in a consultation uh, with, with a large uh, infrastructure software vendor, and they kind of epitomized this definition where basically it was over, the, the DevOps was defined by whatever technology is in vogue at the moment. And there was a great time where if you are using Chef and Puppet and maybe the other two who like we're all quickly forgetting, like that, that, that was doing DevOps, right? Like we started using Chef and Puppet to automate stuff, so we're doing DevOps. We're in the, uh, we're, you know, we're hockey sticking to success and productivity, meeting over. And, and that, that lasted for a long time. And, and you could get such boost from doing that automation that like, you know, you kind of don't want to tell people they're wrong because you don't, you don't want them to stop improving themselves. And then, and then, you know, I think we're, we've just emerged out of this area where, you, you know, people basically look at, if we're using Docker or doing containers, then essentially that's doing DevOps, right? Then that's, that's the DevOps that we're doing and, and we've got that handled in the same way that we're doing that technology. But then, you know, us, us who are not Docker, I would say, we love this kind of like retort to it. It's like, well, here's like Docker and then here's like everything else you need to worry about. And here's like a metaphoric learning curve of how hard it's to get over there. Now, to be fair, all of these vendors want to do all of this stuff, right? Like all of us are after this giant stack of things. But the thing that's trying to be communicated is that it's not just any given one technology that you're going to use that's going to change things, right? It's not like that little bottle of STP or racing stripes that's going to make your like old LeBaron run better. Like you need to actually like do something to it. Maybe buy a new one uh, instead of using that, that, that old one there. Or, or you can, what, what do they call it when you like put absurdly big wheels and make it look like a box of cereal? You could do that to it. That would be great. <clears throat> so wrapping up this delightful middle part, I think if, if, as always, the answers are in the multi-year DevOps report with science that I don't understand and so won't even go over. Uh, the, uh, you know, Nicole is out giving some talks at lots of DevOps days where I think maybe she'll try to understand this and, and, and th that, that team who works on this is actually pretty good at reaching out to you and trying to explain what's going on there. But if, if, we, if we skip between these two slides, and I won't look over them, and, I mean, I, I, won't, I won't read over them in depth, but if you read over this, and here's the presentation you can go look up where they go over these. 
there's a pretty good summary of the behaviors and the technologies that are in use that are defining what DevOps is and are leading to people being more successful with using custom written software. So at the moment, I, th I think if you look through this, I mean, all, both of them are enabling basically continuous delivery, and then you have a, a lean mindset of going through things. But these are the things that you want to be doing to make sure that, that, that you're doing DevOps and getting all those benefits that you hear about. I mean, they have these absurd numbers of 30 and 60x increases and stuff, and you know, most of us are just like, if I could get a 2x improvement, that would be great. Uh, so like, it's, it's worthwhile looking these up and kind of studying them and figuring out what these practices are and seeing if you're doing them. Because when I go out and visit people, like, they usually, like, they kind of, as we'll get to, they kind of speak to doing this stuff, but they're not actually adopting these practices. But again, I think we have a pretty good working definition of DevOps now. And to correct what I was saying, actually back in the comments, every now and then on the register, someone comes, uh, I don't know if it's writing, more like typing to my defense, and they're like, go look at the DevOps report, you idiot. Like, that does come up every now and then, which is, which is heartening to see. So now, let's go over DevOps in the large. Uh, like, like I was saying, there are some things that I think are a little different about large organizations doing DevOps and going through them. Just like if you're a small organization of like one to 10 people, you have different advantages and problems, right? Like you gotta make sure someone cleans the bathrooms out for you, and it's probably something you're gonna be concerned about along with your build. Whereas at a large organization, they don't have to worry about that, but they've got like all these people and regulations and laws and, and like legacy software and stuff they have to cope with. So the Venn diagram of overlap is pretty big between most organizations, but there's something about large organizations that's problematic uh, and, and that, that warrants looking at. And as, as proof of that, going back to the, the DevOps study, so I think it was uh, Donnie Burkholz, who uh, works at 451 and had, had worked at Red Monk, he, went, he asked them to go look back, and uh, I don't know if stratiate is the right word, but it sounds cool, right? and basically analyze, when you look at the high-performing organizations in the DevOps study, and you break them out by company size, uh, can large organizations do DevOps, is basically the question being answered. And when you look at this, you see that or very large organizations of 10,000 plus, like those organizations, we're not necessarily where we go get our hair cut, but that we kind of rely on daily and like pay monthly bills to all the time and the government. So big organizations that run our life, essentially, for us, uh, you know, whether we like it or not, like they are the ones who struggle the most with fitting into the profile of being high performing, right? So large organizations have more problems adopting and using DevOps than smaller organizations. That's the conclusion there. Look, and someone did a screenshot and they forgot to uh, move their mouse. That's always annoying when that pops up. So this, bring, this come, brings to the, the, the first sort of like thing for large companies that, that, uh, that I, I, I try to tell them. And, and like, if, if you remember this scene from Mad Men, I mean, you remember every scene from Mad Men, right? So I'm sorry to bore you with this. But like, Don here has just like, for the umpteenth time, such that it's kind of boring as a story arc, totally like shit the bed of his life. And he's like on this multi-bender and he got fired and like, he has this sense about him that like, I'm Don Draper, right? Like, I'm just gonna be successful. I'll do whatever I need, like it'll work out. Sounds like pretty much every large organization I've encountered, right? And, and like he's got his buddy, he used to be like all crazy, but now he's cleaned up. And, and at one point he's just like, you know what you need to do? You need to do the work, right? Like you need to go in there, just humiliate yourself by being a copywriter, figure out what the work is and do it. You can't just like gloss over and hand wave and stuff. You're not an industry analyst for Christ's sake. You need to like do something. And then sure enough, he does that and it pans out. And, and that, that's really a pattern that I see over and over again with companies. And one of the first things as a pivotal person or just an individual that I go in and tell them is like, so are you actually like doing the work? Are you actually doing agile development? Or are you just like pretending that you're doing it? And, and as proof of that, you see my, my one-two punch of, of funny picture and then chart, right? Like for both sides of your brain, if you still have them. Uh, like, like there's this great survey, uh, and they finally released this recently, but I got this from their, their uh, uh, conference it was at, that the Gartner was doing. And they were asking people, do you do these practices, or are you planning to do them? Over, over again, a small set, but kind of reliable based on the people that they went to, to ask about it. And you can see that after unit testing, which, you know, let's be frank, that's sort of just like, I don't know, sprinkling brown sugar on your oatmeal. It's really easy. It's not a complicated thing to, way to improve things. And it gets you big improvements, just like, Oatmeal on its own is not great, but man, add some sugar and it's basically sugar. But after unit testing, like the people doing these practices falls off like markedly, right? So in your head, add up the blue and the green, right? And those are people who are doing these practices. And you go all the way down to like uh, to DevOps, which doesn't exactly, what kind of mixes with the, the numbers that we saw previously. But 
even things like continuous delivery, right? Like that's been around, I forget when that book was published, it was like 2007 or eight, and you have like such a small amount of the market like actually doing continuous delivery. The more people are doing continuous integration, but the point is, mildly empirically, that might be an insulting word, maybe old Bacon's like rotating in his grave, but like kind of chart, chart scientifically, you can see that people are not doing the work, right? They're not doing the basics. So it's good to go back to your organization, either pat yourself on the back because you're in the blue or, or, or the green here, but kind of figure out if you know what these are and see if you're actually doing them. And you know, chances are the answer is like, oh, let's go get some coffee, uh, you know, because you're, you're not happy with the result. So at a very high level, uh, and, and, and I like to go over this basic thing because as, as evidence from that previous uh, chart, there's not enough people sort of like actually doing the work that seems common and basic. And so I like to go over this idea of small batch thinking, which is a lot of what we're trying to achieve with continuous delivery and lean thinking and things like that. But it's basically thinking on probably realistically a weekly turn cycle of how can we quickly come up with an idea of how to improve a product with software, figure out a way to code it, deploy it to production, and avoid, I mean, not avoid, observe people using it, right? Like, like if I were to tell that to you as I did just now, you're like, that sounds great, you know? Also, do you wanna tell me how like to breathe and do other obvious things? But if you think about like, are you actually doing this where you can, you can deploy a piece of code and you're running a full experiment, full cycle, and getting input and figuring out if it's working? And if it works, of course, you keep doing it. And if it doesn't work, you do something differently. Now, most people I talk with with software, they're happy if they can implement like, you know, half of the stuff in that giant Word doc. Like whether or not it actually gets deployed or anyone uses it, they don't really care. Um, but I would, I would suggest that at all levels, especially at large organizations, it's important to like, understand this sort of lean startup mentality, this scientific approach to doing things, and think about all the way to the top of your organization if people know about this cycle and are applying it to the way that you're doing software. And, I, and I've seen going over this with, with, with uh, executives at various companies that they don't quite think software can operate like this. They don't understand that you can use software in a cycle like this and actually improve it and, and, and very quickly do turns and, and think about new options. So this is another thing to go back to if you're in a large organization and make sure you're doing things this way. You know, the obvious uh, old cliche uh, um, anti-pattern here is the water scrum fall, right? Where, where development or maybe IT is really good at just like building up batches of software that never actually get deployed to production or used. And which is sort of like, if you remember in the goal, there's this great visual of like a guy at a workbench and he's just building up this pile of inventory uh, at, at the, the workbench in front of him. And, and this guy's all happy with himself, but it turns out he's the asshole, right? Like he's just like clogging all this trash into the system that can't get processed. And that's, that's the situation you end up getting in if you're creating these builds and not actually getting into production and using them. And there's plenty of good write-ups down there about it. And there's actually a, a, good, uh, a good sort of case study presentation from uh, a lean startup conference about the IRS of all people doing it. So you can be like, if the IRS can do it, what's our problem? And, and then here's, here's some more uh, sort of verification that taking a small, yeah, good job. <laughs> so <laughs> I, 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 I love all the stuff that we pay for. It's wonderful. And, 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 the, and the collection process is just fine. <laughs> So uh, there, 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 this, you know, this is another good anecdote here on the, uh, on the left side. And it's, it's anonymized, of course. But this is, again, what I see, and it's represented here, that the shorter, you know, and a quarter is probably realistic for most large organizations, but the shorter you make your release windows, chances are the higher success rate you're going to be over time. Now, there's some tricks here, right? Like, of course, you're doing less, right? But you don't focus on, on like the quantity of code that you're shipping, but essentially the impact and the effect that you're having on your end users and that you're reliable about doing it. And then as, as this anonymized person said, right, like when we looked at things that lasted a year or more, they tended to fail at about the same rate, like 80% failure. So you can really get a lot better success and outcome if you, if you think in more of a small batch mentality, which a DevOps approach is always encouraging. And it's kind of like the thing that DevOps is trying to enable. So this also allows you to do another thing that's particular uh, for uh, large organizations, and that's basically dealing with like auditors and bureaucracy and all of this type of stuff, right? And at first, like when you talk about deploying code every week, people just like freak out, right? Like their, their heads explode and they think that all sorts of terrible things are gonna happen. But you know, I, I'd, I'd been talking about this with people enough that I, I started to try to keep track of risks that doing small batches addresses. And there's some obvious ones that if, if you're, if you can deploy every day or every week, right? Like you're deploying less code, so there will be errors because it's software after all. 
but at least you'll have less code that will have, you know, there's less surface area for bugs to occur, right? You don't have six months worth of code that you're gonna discover for the next year all the stuff that you did wrong. And then you also have regular release windows that you can release things at. And then there's the one that's, it's not really often thought of a, of a risk, except in, in large, big blow-ups. But that's like, the biggest risk in software is like, you create software that isn't actually useful. That like, you thought would be a good idea and no one finds it useful to do anything with it. And if you're not releasing every week and observing people using it or not, you're not really gonna have enough speed to know that. But I, I, th I think the ones that most auditors and large organizations respond to better is thinking about things in terms of risk, right? And this chart kind of illustrates that the longer that you're going without releasing software, you're kind of building up this amount of risk. That once you actually release it, after six months, you see that the orange line is the bad one. That is this huge amount of risk that you have. Whereas if you're releasing every week or so, you do build up risk, but you encounter that risk and you run to it and you kind of minimize it and you smooth out your, your risk cycle. And there's also options if you, if you adopt a lot of DevOps and, and agile principles about things always being shippable and, and coherent that like in theory, you could just like stop funding it. That seems to be how Apple runs their product management and Google every now and then. But you can like have that thing there and close down the budgets essentially and you've got a product, right? So you don't have budget overruns. Like you actually have something out there and you can shut it down or not, right? You can keep funding it more. So you have a lot more control. And ultimately that's what bureaucratic people want um, in this situation is they want to have assurances and control over processes and know that you crazy IT people aren't just like, you know, burning piles of cash like we have been for a while. And, and a small batch approach really addresses a lot of this stuff and many of the things that we find in, in DevOps like making work visible and having lots of monitoring and so forth and so on. So just wrapping up quickly, another thing uh, that, that I like to go over with large organizations is they always have a lot of legacy systems. Like, I mean, the IRS is a good example. They still have machines running from the Kennedy administration, which, which is great. The, they work. Uh, so we should give ourselves a pat on the back for being computer people. Um, probably the longest running computers ever. Anyways, uh, and, and what I find is, again, like not doing the obvious sort of agile software development and ways of dealing with, with, uh, with software most mainstream companies don't really have a way of dealing with legacy in place. They don't really have very active portfolio management where they're going in and finding out, discovering all the applications they have, kind of ranking them for business value, putting them on a plan to keep being funded or end of life. Like they, they don't really have those notions. So that's the first thing. Make sure you have some sort of portfolio management uh, plan in place. And then if you haven't like virtualized a lot of these things, that's another good step. That, this is all, these are all just cheap tricks, like you know, sugar on your oatmeal to do things. Because the real answer is that once you, once you take rid of all the low-hanging fruit, there really are no good answers for how to deal with legacy. It's just a problem, right? It's a hassle. And that's a huge part of what large organizations are faced with is all that existing stuff. So there's some great like development patterns. You, you can follow like the Strangler pattern, which is very well documented. There's a good illustration of, of how that could go terribly wrong in the new Jungle Book movie. If you remember the pivotal scene at the end, no spoilers, but it's the fig vine tree there. So you gotta watch out with that a little bit. But, the other thing that you want to do at, at, at a large organization level is think about what method of portfolio management do I have in place? And I'll just throw out that there's, there's a, good, a good example that's written up in Escape Velocity. And this one, it probably is better to read the HBR article. But it's, it's basically applying an old management consulting gimcrack, the three horizon thinking, and applying that to the way that you do your software management. It's really worth looking into that because it's, it's a theory of management that's built around uh, I guess you could call them selfish actors, right? Like it, it says like given the way that business works and that people want money, they keep ruining innovation based on the present interest and making money in the present. So how do we organize your, your system so that that happens less? So finally, uh, this is the most speculative part and I'd be interested in hearing uh, y'all's input. And that's sort of like staffing, like the type of people and, and how you staff a project and things like that. And, a lot, of, a lot of this new stuff can seem like you know, the Oregon Trail, right? We're gonna send these people out and it's gonna be disaster and blow up and you'll die of dysentery, if, if you remember that. That was always a fun thing to play in school. But what, what I've noticed, and, and I, I, you know, this, this is always skates ter terribly close to another DevOps taboo, which is this bimodal IT. You can like, give nightmares to all sorts of people if you mention that. But as I go out and I talk with large organizations who are applying DevOps and just more an agile mindset of doing things, I've noticed that there's kind of a, a multi-staffing way that they do things. They identify, you know, what they'll usually call like cowboys, right? People who like really want to do new things and like once it gets to version 1.1 of something, they're like out. They're not interested at all. 
Uh, and, but these are the people you want to go out and kind of like explore and experiment with new ways of doing things. And if you haven't been to the Driscoll, right, like this is the thing they're not afraid of, like getting your, your boot caught in a stirrup and you better hope you have a buddy who can shoot the horse out from under you before your head gets bashed against the rocks. Like that's the way they want to operate. Versus like most other people in large organizations, and to be frank, like people like me who concern, consume services from large organizations, I want them to be like city folk like stable, reliable, no crazy experimentation, right? And I think garbage people epitomize that, or garbage trucks, right? Like, you don't really notice it, except when you're like, oh, crap, I forgot to take the garbage out, like, early in the morning. But, like, if, if they don't pick it up, you notice it for sure, and things, like, go terribly wrong, right? Like, you literally have trash piling up in the street, right? And that's, that's definitely not a good scene. And, and if we had those cowboys people running the garbage truck, like, I don't think that would work out. And, you know, you could, maybe you could think about some sort of DevOps thing where, like, well, maybe we could have the cowboys happy with the garbage people and the garbage people over there. But, uh, yeah, that would be great. But in the meantime, you know, make, make sure that, like, you know what your staff are capable of and what they want to do. And you sort of assign not necessarily an application or a project, but you bring them on at the right life moment of your application, right? Whether it's new or maintaining it or stabilizing it. And, you know, maybe you move them in and out. But it's good to be aware of, of these, these two types of, of mindsets that you have and, and know how to use them. So with that, I'm a little bit over, so I'm stealing time. Uh, I always like to end with this, this bit from the Agile Manifesto because it's kind of what, uh, what I'm always trying to do out in the world and what we're definitely trying to do at Pivotal. And uh, thanks. I, I'll, I'll be at the Pivotal table. I'm happy to answer any other questions or just around. And I'll see everyone next time. Thank you, Cote. And a couple minute break, and we'll get started with the uh, with Jody. <laughs>